more going than anything else, but fair enough. Um, that was a great, great uh, way of, talk, of getting into my talk right now. And as I've got a big mouth and I'm stupid, I have talked about two different things when I wrote the outline of this talk. So I'm going to cover one of them rather quickly and then one of them much, much longer. And what I'm going to talk much, much longer about is what he just pointed out that the tech giants like my employer and other people are actually thinking far ahead on what humans can do and what humans should do with computers. Whereas we as developers and as designers and as users of the web are actually not thinking the way how the next uh, the next round of engineers or the next round of users are going to interact with our systems and interact with our products. I disagree to a degree that we actually all going to be talking to our computers because it's not scaling. If you're in an office like here where everybody would talk to their computer, that's not going to be fun. And uh, in China, WeChat is a great success because the internet is very uh, censored and uh, very slow. So, like next year in England, when the government is going on with what they want to do right now, <laughs> then maybe we will have more voice recognition again going on as well. So, I'm Chris Hartman. I work as a senior program manager for Microsoft. And it was funny, he said, like, I don't get to explain senior product manager when I got the new job. And I talked to my mom, who doesn't speak English, but she speaks German, which is my father. And I told her I'm senior program manager, and she's like, oh, so you look after the stuff for old people then. Because <laughs> <laughs> for her it was like senior program manager, the program for senior citizens. So, and that's where we get into these things, when we use words and we use humans to actually interact with our stuff. We think sometimes far too technical, we think too clever, we don't allow people to make mistakes, and we're great at making mistakes. That's what we do best. So. Aldous Huxley, a very cheerful young man, uh, said technological progress has really provided us with more efficient means of going backwards. <coughs> and I kind of don't agree with him, but I kind of agree with him as well. Because I've been loving the web since the very beginning. I used to be a radio journalist, newscast on a radio station, and then I found the internet and said, like, cool, I can talk to people worldwide. They can, they can translate my stuff for me. They can find me in other times while I'm asleep, when I don't have to be at 3 o'clock at night in a radio station. But the web revolution gave us all these things. So we had content on demand in an easily consumable format. HTML is not pretty, but it's easy to consume. No matter what you have, a text browser, a, a graphical browser, later on a HoloLens, and all these things, HTML can be understood by those things. Interfaces customizable to end user needs. People can translate your websites and then read them in their language. People can do a control plus or a command plus and make the font bigger and smaller, and there's nothing you can do against this. And there's nothing you should do against this because people like me have glasses and sometimes need bigger fonts. And I want it, I have a lot of money I want to give to you, but I can't give it to you if I can't read your bloody navigation. <laughs> so let me change that interface to my needs. 24-7 access, of course, and small footprint that focus on the most important content. When websites were slow, like connections were like <laughs> these kind of things, we, we made sure that the most important content is at the beginning. Nowadays, we give people a 5 megabyte hero image and 12 animations before they can see the first piece of text that they came for, because it's much more important what we done rather than what they came for. So what's happening right now? Everything must get bigger all the time. The average website is 2.2 megabytes. If I'm on a SIM card that is on roaming, which is now illegal in Europe, so next year you get it again in England, <laughs> <laughs> this might be 24 pounds, which is the same as the ticket price for four kids in the cinema. So I don't want to spend that money on your website, but we need to grow, we need to change, we need to put features in. Everybody wants to have a hamburger menu, everybody wants to have 12 car carousels. We cannot just have a text page because that's boring, right? Well, if it's accessible, why is that boring? We compete on features. We want new things all the time. Pinterest does this. Our website should probably do that as well. Uh, Spotify does this. Our website probably should have that as well. Although we sell garden plants or something. But Spotify is successful, so we're going to do the same thing. Tracking, advertising, and forced interaction with users is the number one thing I see on the web nowadays. Like, when you have, when you have a tracker like I have open and the HTTP sniffer, you see where your data goes. It's just boring. And it's just scary because I don't know, I can't pronounce some of these companies. And the forced interaction is my favorite. When you go to a website now and you get a new API, I worked in Firefox on the notifications API, and now I got web notifications. Every website now, you go to like, do you want to get notified when there's something new here? And I'm like, I haven't even looked at you. 
you know, buy me a glass of wine first or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just push it in my face because I don't want it yet. <laughs> Publishers want more control of the interfaces and that's why they go for native apps. All people on the web can, can change things. I don't want that. I, I know what's good for our users, so I do a native app instead and let people download 50 Mac for every interchange that I do with my new logo. This website needs browser X is a thing again. I've been fighting this for years and years. When I started at Microsoft in my job interview, the first question was, what do you want to do here? And I said, kill Internet Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> and people <laughs> that because I worked on a new browser and so that got rid of that uh, he who must not be named IE6 kind of thing out there. <laughs> but nowadays, I see people like, okay, this only works on Chrome. And it's never a technical decision, it's always a business decision because all of our people are using Chrome and the numbers, the only numbers we have, stepcounter.com, tell us everybody only uses Chrome. So what's going on? There's a gap between our end users and us. We build on fast machines with fast connections. We don't build on shitty old computers. We don't have a four-year-old Android machine with a three, a three SIM card to basically, not the three, con the three connection SIM, that basically shows the, how the thing is loading while it's loading rather than using it. We define an ideal subset of our users to cater for. This is what we do. Every time we talk about UX, this ends up that way. Well, nobody does that, so don't worry about it. We build this later. You never build anything later in your life. That's always a lie. <laughs> we assume because, no, because of our knowledge what people want and push them on a happy path. This is what people want us to do probably the things that we want to sell to them, rather than like the things that they really came for. My favorite was always price comparison websites. They're all a scam, every single one of them. They're all like, the, 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 the highest ranked thing is the thing that they would need to sell or they got the most money for. We made coding the most important thing and deliver more faster a goal. And this drives me crazy. I've been developing in assembly language, and Commodore 64, games writing, these kind of things. I've been programming my whole life. I don't want people to learn to code. We're past this. I want you to understand code, but I don't want you to need to code everything. I want you to use things that make sense and understand what you're doing. When I interview people in job interviews and they showed me JavaScript that they used from somebody else, but they understood what they were doing, I hired them more than people that rewrote the same thing that they've seen 50 times before already. This is about learning from other people. This is about sharing information on the internet, and it means sharing code. It doesn't mean using random shit and then selling it as your own. It means understanding it and doing something with it. It's time to reevaluate what we do. The form factors of interaction with the web have changed. We just heard about this. Mobile first is a thing. People use their mobile phone. That doesn't mean they use their mobile phone or exclusively though. A lot of people surf on their mobile phone and then buy it on their desktop. So your interface should be good on both of them and not give me a mobile interface on my desktop where the buy button is 6,000 pixels wide and I'm like, what's going on here? People are disappointed by the noise and take aggressive measures. Ad blockers, browsers like Brave, these kind of things. This is an arms race. This is dangerous because the more ads we block, the more aggressive the other ads will become. And they don't do that by asking us what they could sell us. They, they do it by tracking us and reading our information from other tabs and so on and so forth. Install numbers on app stores are plummeting. It's all terrible. I mean, uh, there's, there's a point that at, at one time the Android store had 60% of the apps have never been downloaded. They're just there. They're just unhappy apps. Don't build unhappy apps. Apps are there for users. If they don't get downloaded, they have not fulfilled their purpose. And we did that because we put barriers in people's ways. We said, okay, you want this? Cool, here's a button, click on it, go to an app store, enter a credit card, pint of blood, first porn song, <laughs> and then you can actually download 60 Mac on your three connection for two and a half hours, and then you see something that you don't like, so you have to uninstall it again. We went back to the times where we had CD-ROMs to install software from. This was stupid. The web is there already to distribute content in a much easier fashion. So forcing people into a form factor does not work. People are sick of installing and upgrading apps if all they do is to read, uh, if, all, if all they do is to read or buy something. I have that. Every time I come home, my wireless kicks in and says like, 550 apps on your phone want to update. I'm like, I don't even know what these things are anymore. Why do I have those? It's like I just delete them all by now and I didn't miss any of them yet. This is pretty amazing. So let's go back to what the web is good at, delivering content on demand and cater to the user's environment. 
And I'm going to go through that very quickly, and it's called the Progressive Web App. I just gave a talk on last Tuesday about this. I gave a talk every week right now at other conferences, so you find a lot of information about Progressive Web Apps. But what it means is to deliver your content on the web accessible as a link, highly shareable. The way to install it is to follow a link. It's already installed by the time you look at it. And how cool is that? Because I can put that in a chat system, in an email, on my dog, on a paper, on a poster, I can send it to you with uh, subsonic sounds. Anyway, a link can be sent to you because it's a distribution model. You create a manifest file to tell the world that this is not a website, but it is installable. It, become an, it can become an icon, and it does other things than a website does. It does the things that you expect from an app to do. It delivers from a secure source to allow runtimes to give you access to APIs like geolocation, camera, and so on and so forth. If you don't send your content over HTTPS, you'll be very, very unhappy in August, uh, because about October. Because then every single browser we have, we announced that with each other, are going to flag up websites as insecure. Now we flag up HTTPS websites as secure. Now, uh, but we're going to flag all other websites up as insecure. Because they are. As soon as you put things over HTTPS, I can be a hotel manager that has all the routers over here in this office and make your website look as something else. Attack in the, uh, man in the middle attacks on HTTP are a very important thing. The great thing about HTTPS is not only get you access to all these APIs, but also Google likes you more. So think about doing HTTPS. It's free now with that's encrypt.org. Use notifications for re-engagement of users. Don't make the pop-ups too old, please. Don't tell me, like, something new is there. Please come to our website. Tell me what the thing is and let me buy it with a, with a button. Don't tell me that there's something there, please, to discover, because I don't want to discover anymore. You already have my attention. Make me buy something. Make me do something. Make me tell you something. Service workers are the big trick about this. This is a new API or newish API that we had. What it allows you to do is reliably control caching on end users' devices. So instead of hoping the browser caches things, you say, I want to cache all images and put these five images in there. And then you know these images will always be available for the user, even if he's disconnected from the web, even if they have a flaky connection to the web. You provide a great experience on flaky and unavailable connections. You update and refresh your solution in the background. Twitter Lite is what I use now instead of Twitter. And when Twitter changed their, their, uh, their little buttons to rounded corners again, in the end, the world ended for lots of people because they <laughs> had to install it again. I didn't even realize it until, uh, until they told me that because my Twitter had already updated because it's just a PWA. Inform users when new functionality is available and say, like, hey, there's something you, you want it or don't you want it. That was another big problem of native apps. They always ask you to for everything because they couldn't ask you later on to get access to the camera when they need it. So users install a solution by using it. It's try before you buy. App permissions are fluid. You can ask users on the fly for more functionality and they can revoke it. And updates are friction free. Users get new functionality without a dance around the app store. 70% of the users are being lost by downloading your app. You don't need to have that pain in your life. You can do the PWA. Anyways. Instead of people catering to our needs, let's offer a platform for them to choose us. The thing about a PWA is I go to your website, the second time you tell me, hey, I'm offline now, the third time you ask, do you want me on your desktop as an icon? So people promote the experience of your product into an app rather than having an app as the experience. And this is great because that means the interface has to become much more human, much better. The interfaces we build now condition users of tomorrow, and that's why we have these things like keyword searches. Nobody expects computers to be cleverer than that. We just expect to have to click on things and find things around. I love this one when there's, uh, there was this video hanging the other day. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is not a good experience, of course, the joke. The other day, I tried to get the Stanford Express, and this is the experience I got there. And I'm like, this is not fun. This is not, I, I don't want to play whack a mole in navigation. <laughs> and uh, nobody tested that thing you know, on, a, uh, on a touch interface because that was on my surface there. It's like, nice. <laughs> it's time for us to use and build better, more human interfaces. And this is where I'm coming in right now and with the machine learning stuff and going away from PWAs. Technology is there to aid humans, do things, and then go away. We've been slaves to technology for far too long. We had to change our language, we had to change our interaction models, we had to change the way we work with technology because technology was shit. 
And nowadays, technology is actually catering to us much more. But we are not wired like that. We still think it's too complex. Whereas like kids or people who just start getting into technology have a much, a much simpler way. So what can machines do for humans? Prevent us from making mistakes. Do boring, repetitive tasks. Fill gaps in information. Remember and categorize for us. Make us understand better. Allow us to communicate more. And protect us from harm. Machines and computers are there for that. I don't have more respect for my MacBook than I have for a shovel or my surface. This is a tool for doing a thing for me that I don't want to do myself. So what does that mean? Preventing us from making mistakes. If you ever used any text editor or now any text field in most operating systems and you do something wrong, there's a squiggly line under it and tells you you've done something wrong. This is cool. This is amazing. But how people still have have uh, like daily mail kind of headlines online, I don't understand, because the mistakes cannot be done anymore, just follow that thing. That's why I love linting in editors. I love linting much more in, in code editors than, uh, than a build script that tells me that went wrong. Why do you allow me to write that mistake in the first time? While I'm typing, you can tell me that's obviously wrong what you're doing here. Much better way of dealing with it. To boring repetitive tasks. J.P. Morgan realized that actually lawyers have not fun looking up all his uh, historical cases of uh, court cases. So computers are much better at that. They do repetitive, boring tasks happily. Humans are terrible at doing repetitive, boring tasks because the more we do them, the more mistakes we make because we're bored. We don't want to do them. Computers are like, oh, it's the same data again. Great. Whereas like, <laughs> humans are like, I've done that already. Why do I have to do it again? Fill gaps in information. This is my favorite when it comes to machines and uh, science fiction and television, when they're always like, oh, did you see there's like the CCTV footage? And they're like, oh, there is like a reflection on a half cap of somebody's sunglasses that reflects into another car, and we get the license plate from that. So can you zoom into that and get the data out there? I always thought it was funny. Now we have it. There's actually a white paper about it called Pixel Recursive Super Resolution that gets faces out of an 8x8 grid by comparing it to millions and millions of other faces that are already available on the web. This is actually in use in NVIDIA's new product where you have a pixelated JPEG and it actually fills in the gaps and the mistakes for you to get a proper, uh, a proper high resolution of, picture of, a, uh, of a picture that was badly converted already. Computers remember and categorize for us. In, uh, in Spotlight and also in Cortana, you can type in my documents larger than 20 pages. I've never done this because I've been conditioned to com that, that computers are stupid. But people who trust computers to be magical boxes do these kind of things. And they are as magical to actually give us those right now. You can say like documents I wrote after 3 o'clock. These kind of things. Human interaction is possible already in operating systems. Google uh, Photos, if I enter selfie, I would never tag anything as a selfie because it's embarrassing. But whenever I looked into the camera and realized it was a selfie, obviously that was the wrong camera that I turned on there. <laughs> but the same way, I can write, I can type in Katze, which is cat in German. I don't tag any of my stuff in German. So it didn't find anything that like, hey, what's Katze in, uh, in English? Oh, it's cat, so let me show you photos of your cat. How cool is that, that the computer allows me to make mistakes and do, uh, gives me something useful out of it. I can do Essen, which in German means food, and it finds all kinds of food, like uh, crisps and also ice cream and also sushi. It also makes us understand better. I can go to Google Maps and say, like, how long does it take to get from here to the capital of Denmark? I was in Sweden at that time, so that's why it's not England right now. But I realized that here is actually where I am right now, and the capital of Denmark is easy to look up, that's Copenhagen. So let's go, let's show you the map after that, not like, I don't know, please enter the right keyword and go on with it. I mean, we don't find these things out. You see people who don't know computers try these things out, and like, that's how cool we are, that's how far we are already. Uh, Facebook, if you don't do alternative text because you hate blind people, you actually just get them automatically generated for you. So in this case, it says here, image may contain dog, outdoor, and nature. So every time it says image may contain, that was, that was Facebook's uh, 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 machine learning, deep learning algorithm that compared the image to others, millions and millions of pictures, and did this kind of conversion for you. Uh, that is also in PowerPoint, so it, it is not really an interesting thing, so everywhere else. If you drag an image in there, it gives you a description of that image automatically already, because search engines like these kind of things as well, as much as humans do, so we automatically generated that for them. 
Uh, Captionbot AI is a great demo for that, where you can upload an image and it says, like, I think it's a young man jumping in the air on a skateboard. And you realize there's three things at play here. There's analyzing the image, there's comparing the image with millions and trillions of images online, and then there is finding keywords and saying, like, man, age, uh, jumping, skateboard, and then it made a whole sentence out of it by using another uh, deep learning algorithm that makes it a proper sentence and not like, say, man, keyboard, skateboard, which is not good enough for humans. iPoly is a great startup, um, and I don't know where they are, probably American, but uh, they have a, a deep learning network on the phone itself for blind people, so you can actually go around, and while you, while you, you film things, it tells you what these things are, so you can say, like, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, and all kind of things. Apple is working on that on the next chipset as well, and I've played with this, it's pretty amazing what they do, but uh, they've been using our services for that one as well, or I think Google's as well in, in, in other languages. But it's pretty amazing how we can actually allow people to see their environment because they have a camera in their phone. That's a chat system somewhere in Taiwan, I can't remember the name right now, but you can actually type it into English and the other person gets it in, uh, in Chinese, Taiwanese on the other side, and it also gets the emotion back and forth between those two. So even if you don't speak the right language, it's not as embarrassing as it used to be to go into Google Translate and copy and paste and hope you don't insult somebody's grandmother. <laughs> it's actually pretty, pretty amazing how far these things have become, have come. Protect us from harm. A Chinese factory replaces 90% of human workers with robots. Production rises 250%. Effects drop by 80%. Good. I'm, uh, I'm an invited expert from the German government on what machine learning means for the job market, and I mostly tell them, you're all out of a job. <laughs> and that's okay, because jobs like these are not made for humans. That's where, that's where humans get sick. That's where humans make mistakes. That's where humans are bored. We're better than that, and we should be much further up the in uh, up the uh, line of doing things with, with our brains and on our hands that make sense for humans to do. We built robots to do these things for us. Now, a few years ago, all of this was pure science fiction. And even today, it feels like it's too hard to do, right? I mean, I feel stupid when I talk to data scientists. I feel stupid when I talk to our machine learning people, and that's good. I like feeling stupid. I like feeling stupid for a few months, and then maybe get cleverer. This is good. It keeps me humble. The trick to understand is that we live in a world of services, clouds, databases, and products. We're not living in a world where you have to write everything from scratch and you have to understand all the code that you're doing, all the services that you're doing. Competitors of you are using that stuff without thinking about it, so you might as well start considering making your life easier as well. And I do blame for that as well. I hate using other people's products, but there's so many good products out there, it's much more fun to do by now. All players are doing a great job giving you access. Sarah Robbins and a friend of mine, uh, S. Rock Tweets, gave a great talk about machine learning at Google I.O. this year, where she talked a few of the other things that, I, uh, that I'm going to cover here as well. Almost every company offers APIs for that. Uh, Google has uh, uh, the TensorFlow, has uh, some REST APIs, AWS has their REST APIs, Facebook has a few things, uh, IBM has, um, has Watson. They're all available for you. REST endpoints with support for Node or even client-side JavaScript. You don't need to be a Python or an F-sharp programmer or a, a, a Go programmer to do this. You can do this in a browser in the developer tools if you wanted to. All of these turn images, audio, video, foreign text, gestures, faces, emotions into JSON objects for you to do stuff with. Translation, analysis, images to text, video to text, audio to text. A lot of work went into these APIs, work you might not want to do yourself. Of course, computers are not clever. They need lots and lots and lots and lots of data to compare with each other, to find patterns, and then give you the right results. You don't have all that data. You don't have all that computing power. So these APIs are built on trillions and trillions of nodes of computers, cloud-based machines that you don't have to feel getting hot while you're trying to do that. I've harvested tons and tons of data over the last years. And I'm talking a lot about this, like, where's the ethical thing of, uh, of machine learning? And the sad thing about 1984 is not only that it's here, but he didn't predict that we're going to buy the cameras that's spy on us rather than, like, waiting for the government to install. So we've been giving our data for free services away for a long, long time. It's time for us to get this data back and do something good with it. The biggest problem was to understand the data. It was a mess. It's just like people are like, oh, well, I don't care about the quality of it. I just upload it. So we need to find the patterns and make it cleaner. So we train machines in thousands of iterations to get the best information of a small set of data. 
and then compare with a big set of data and find the patterns again on that, and so on and so forth. Again, computers like doing these things. Humans don't want to go through the same iteration over and over again. A great example of Sarah was the language APIs that they're using right now. So you got like the natural language API helps us understand text. In the past, we would have just split this at the spaces and then hope we know what nouns are and these kind of things. But now we do a proper uh, linguistic analysis on this. That's why Google is hiring uh, uh, singers and poets and, uh, and linguists for doing these kind of things. So in this case, we have a dependency. It all comes down to helps. The rest is actually dependent on that helps. This is the main purpose here. Then we pass the labels. We say that that's a subject, that's the root, that's a, comp uh, a computation and whatever doctrine means. And then we have a part of speech, so we've got a noun, we've got a verb, we've got a, a punctuation. This where English is great, because English is so easy in terms of syntax. Every other language is much more on the corner. In English, you can always know it's an SPO going on, so that's pretty nice. And then we got a lemma, a lemma, which is where the other ones stand from, and then you realize helps come from help, and other inflections of that same word. And once we put all these together, we get a much better result. So for example was the uh, original Spanish text of the Harry Potter book retranslated into, into English again, which had things like necklace in there and like fence of the gardens, which is not proper English. And with the new neural machine translation, we got garden fence and we got almost twice as long as usual and we got without a neck instead of necklace in there. So now these translations look much more human because we translate full sentences and not only keywords. So this is great, we have all these things, but a lot of times you have like specialized data. So you have, for example, in ASOS, you would have these great words that you call things, like all the things on my coffees or what this is. Nobody knows that on the web. So you need to train these systems with your own data sets and start getting better results that way. So this is a system called Chris, I'm gonna come back to that later on as well. So this one was where we asked kids to talk about uh, their favorite books, but we didn't tell the machine that it was about books. So the first on the, on the left-hand side, translate banana dogs, guys, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But once we told the machine that this is about books and we gave it some books to actually read, or some kids' books to read, it gave us the right-hand side and then all of a sudden it made sense. So you have to feed your own data to the machine and tell what you're looking for. So out of the box, most systems find you things like geolocation places, it finds you things like tasks like buying tickets, tasks like understanding, translating, time, time and date, these kind of things are always built in. But if you need specialist terms, then you need to do that. Chris also allows you to do that with a audio profile. So what we did with it is a few airports in America where we have like people talking into, the, into, a, into a desk, one of these things. And it was the sound didn't work. It was only like every third or fourth word. So we took like 80 hours of recordings of audio of how people talk at airports to tell the computer, filter that one out and only get the one that is not like that to actually get the results. So the great video of how the quality of it went, went up 20%. The good news for us is that we can now use these findings to build better interfaces. So what we can do with technology for our users, the same things that I said our computers can do for us. Prevent mistakes before they happen. Language Understanding Intelligent Service, Lewis, is a service that you can use for that. So in this case, it finds out like, okay, turn the right light on, the left right on. That's where you can train a machine for a specific task to find out different iterations of what humans would be saying to not have uh, none of the problem that if somebody talks to a machine, nothing happens. That is the biggest problem that we have to feel right now. When a human interface doesn't work, it's much more disappointing for end users and much more like, okay, I'm not going to use it any longer. People are not as um, patient as they were with like the wrong keyword. Of course, it's magic, you know, if magic doesn't happen and magic doesn't work, then we're, then we're disappointed and we don't want to do anything. I also find the psychological thing quite cool when you give somebody Siri or Cortana or Google Now, they're going to do like two or three searches and then like cool, and then they're going to find something that it doesn't know. A psychological thing of like, I'm cleverer than the machine, haha, it doesn't know about that. You're like, you just proved that you would never search for that thing, but okay, you're better than the computer, fine. Uh, two boring repetitive tasks. OCR scanning is not fun. Finding text and images and turning it into images, uh, into text, not fun. So it's an OCR service and almost all of those, this is ours, but now finds the life is like riding a bicycle to keep your balance, you must keep moving. But it, it also detects the language, it detects the orientation, 
And the bounding box where in the image these texts are. So in case you want to highlight them, in case you want to do something else, to translate them, to put them back into it. If you haven't tried Google Translate on Android yet, it's pretty amazing. Where you just film something, and while you're filming it, it translates the word into another language. It's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, thumbnail generation. Thumbnail generation is not fun. Finding like lots of images and turning them into thumbnails, and especially resizing that thing into a small thumbnail where the lady would be like a green, gray, uh, green, yellow blob, uh, yellow, red blob, would be not the right thing to do. So what these algorithms do is like, first of all, they center on the images, like you see on the middle there. They center on the face of the lady. So instead of having the uh, having her on the side, you now have it in the middle of it. And then you do a black and white version or a an 8 bit version of that image and find the outlines of the lady to make sure that every thumbnail in every size has as much or as little of the person in it. So that is something we normally did with Photoshop for months and months and we don't need to do that anymore because there are services to do that. A great one is Cloudinary, a company in Israel, um, that actually has an API for that. So you have a REST API up there, but just in the URL, you say here's an image. Give me the uh, give it to me the 16 by 9 uh, ratio, 640 pixels wide, and here's the image that I want you to do. So instead of having to create all these images, you can create them on the fly and cache them, and you can also center on, on faces. You can find out if there's text and center on the text. These kind of things. Uh, our vision API, Google's as well, gives you things like faces, and it gives you things like what's in the image itself here. So in this case, it's a man swimming. But the information I got is like, I got water, I got sport, I got swimming, I got pool, I got water sport, and it also gives you the confidence levels of what the uh, what it is likely to be in there. So that's where you can make these sentences that I showed you earlier, a young man jumping on a skateboard, because the description is another model that's not on the screenshot anymore. It also finds out if the image has a person on it, it finds out if the image is racy or if it's adult content, so you automatically filter with those. But video is much more interesting, right? Images, we've done that for years. This is a great service called videobreakdown.com, which is just using a few APIs. And what it does is you upload an image, a video to it, and it gives you a transcription. That's nothing new. YouTube has done that for years, and we, we create uh, sometimes very comical subtitles that way. But it also found out all the people that are speaking in that video and automatically tagged them for you. As these were known actors, we already found out who they are. If it's people that you are, that you have in your office, you have to tag them and name them. But if they're known people, like in this case, Christian Bale, it actually pulled the image in there, and that is an English actor. And you see in the, uh, in the throttle down there where in the video he's speaking and where he's presenting. You also have topics that were, that were taken out of the content of the audio, and you have a speech sentiment. So you have the sentiment where it's neutral, where it's angry, where people are happy. And this is cool if you, for example, do user testing and you have videos of that. How cool is it to run it through a system like that and find out where the users were confused, where the users were unhappy. That, that works for text, for video, for audio. So say, for example, I work with a lot of companies that get shit lots of comments. And what they want to do is run it through a sentiment analysis because the most angry comments are the ones you want to answer first, right? Those people are out of your hair, then you have time for the other people. But you don't want to go through millions of com uh, comments yourself. A system like that can do that for you. Facial recognition is a big thing as well. We know that every time we come to the country, and it's very annoying when it doesn't work, because I tell them why it doesn't work. But when I say that, they don't let me in the country. So what it does, it finds not only the face, but also its orientation, like uh, how many angle, what's the angle of the, uh, of the face, if it's sideways, if it's, uh, if it's up, down, these kind of things. And it gives you an ID of the face that we don't store, but you can use to actually then reuse in other photos and tag people automatically, much like Facebook has done for years. When you tag somebody, all of a sudden that name appears in other photos as well. That's exactly the same thing that happened here. Um, the really, really nice thing about this one is that getting all these features, you can do a proper a, a proper recognition, and we're going to come back to that in a second. Uh, Windows Hello, when I use it on my Surface Book, we've got three cameras in there and an infrared camera. So you cannot hold a picture of me in front to unlock my computer because I need to move and I need to have a pulse and a temperature, otherwise it will not unlock the machine for me. So the pulse and the temperature thing we don't have in there, but the three angles you can build yourself in JavaScript if you wanted to. Uh, you got the landmarks, you got the pupils, you got the uh, the face, you can be painted with moustache on people, for example, by finding their face because we're bored. 
And once you know that, once you found out that these are people of a certain gender, of a certain age, you can cluster them automatically and then have a data set of all the searchable pictures that you had before that you never had the information or didn't want to type it in. So the next thing is uh, emotions. Um, emotional recognition in audio and video and, and images is incredibly important because it only not only allows you to categorize your images the right way, but to find out when something happened. I did the other day in the, in the Berlin office, I did a smile to get a cappuccino, uh, just with my service book, and people, when they, when they were smiling, then we got the coffee machine started. When they were not smiling, they didn't get a coffee. So we recognize anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, neutral, sadness, and surprise. I call it reading Twitter in the morning. <laughs> but these are all the features that you have. Uh, others just have a like, is angry, is not happy, and you get a zero to one uh, uh, confidence level here as well. And then we want new ways of communicating with people. So a uh, custom speech service allows people to speak into it and to train it properly. If you want to get something really, really scary, look at liarbird.ai. Liarbird.ai is a startup where you can speak uh, for 10 minutes into it, and then it will speak any text in your voice. Which is, of course, cool when you're back. Like, for example, mine here in England now does voice recognition to log in. So I tried it out. It's actually broken already. So we have to find a way around that. So this is a pretty cool way to, for people to interact with it. Gesture recognition is another API that we just had where you can use your hand and recognizes hand waving and these kind of things. So that's great for like little uh, Raspberry Pi demos and these kind of things. Sound recognition and of course facial recognition when people just change their face with facial uh, uh, appearance to do something different. The custom speech service allows you to do so all of these things. So you create custom language models by speaking into it or giving it lots of WAV files. You can create the acoustic model and say, like, that's Christian speaking. And then you run it over, over the videos and find out where I was speaking. Custom models, and then all of them become an endpoint and a REST API. You can use this for verification, of course. Once you, once you recognize my face and you've got the ID, you can say, like, OK, here's an is identical and a confidence level of it, so that way you can automatically tag lots of people and lots of images. And you can do that also with all kinds of things. It's a data model, so if it's a human data model, fine. We also did like whatdog.net, where you can upload a picture of a dog and it tells you what breed it is. I'm a German Shepherd, then weirdly enough. Of course, people use it to upload their own images, but whatever data model you can train the computer with, you can do things with it, and then we find out what dog breed is going on there. We can also protect us and save our end users, and this is where content moderation APIs come in. We've got a content moderation API that tells you if something is adult content, if something is racy content, but also if something is incredibly illegal content. Together with Google and Facebook and others and Interpol, we have a data set of, uh, uh, of images that just should not be on the web, and that your moderation people should never have to see. A computer doesn't care if they look at a video of a decapitation. A human needs uh, psycholo uh, psychological treatment after that. <laughs> so let's make sure we don't need ever to see horrible things that people uploaded by using a moderation API to actually say, OK, this is not there anymore. This is just deleted because it should have never been in the web in the first place or on this planet. Yeah, so these are all REST endpoints. Use them to build human interfaces. You've got computer vision APIs, content moderator, video API, and so on and so forth. And I don't need you to use Microsoft. Of course, cool. But like, you can use Apple's. No, you can't. You can use uh, IBM's. You can use uh, Google's. You can use Amazon's. They all have these services. You will not be able to build these yourself unless you have it and build a startup and get VC people to throw money at you. This is what's happening right now. But using those to build more human interfaces is, is something I think we owe our end users. And we owe the next end users for them, for whom computers are a normal thing in their life and not magical boxes that we don't trust. And we like, oh, I need to type in keywords and talk like a robot to them. People are used to those things nowadays. And uh, I don't see us having like a controlled voice control for everything in our lives. This is a nice marketing model right now. I find it very bizarre that both at Build and at Google I.O. this year, one of the biggest problems we announced on stage was that people have too many computers that don't talk to each other. Like, that's not a problem. That is like the most weirdest 
problem I've ever heard. We've got cancer to fix, you know? <laughs> We've got like children dying, these kind of things. Machine learning can do all these cool things as well. We've done things like uh, uh, agricultural analysis of satellite photos to find out where a crop would get diseased and would get uh, would be able to, to need kind of like changes in cutting out. We cut down the water usage of a field in Africa just by finding out where the crop needs water rather than watering the whole field, again with image analysis. These things are possible, but we, we talk about like, oh, it would be so good if I could ask my computer what the weather is like. Just open the bloody window, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Our job right now is to create interfaces that are simple, human, and fun to use. And these are not keyword searches. These are not navigations that need five clicks to go through. These are things that intuitively feel right. And we've done, we have enough data, we have enough algorithms, we have enough services to build these kind of things. So he has to use technology to do this in the background as a helper, not as a demand or burden to our end users. You should not have to buy a $900 phone to be able to type in where is the capital of Denmark. You should just have a computer that's connected to the internet, and this is what all these APIs offer you to do. There's no such thing as a perfect user. If you want to think about what, what the next step will be is a great white paper uh, by our design department called Inclusive Design, which explains that disability that we always talk about is like a problem. It's not a problem at all, because disability is not a black and white state, it's a, it's a shade of gray. Somebody who's deaf has the same problem as a bartender that is in, an exp uh, in, a, in a loud pub. People who actually, who actually uh, I learned English from subtitles from captioning in videos, because listening to the audio of a native speaker and reading along teaches your language so much better than just reading it or just listening to it, because Monty Python explains a lot. It was the only thing that wasn't dubbed in Germany. But it's just beautiful. My favorite example of this one is the one with the, uh, the one-armed lady, where they, where they have the number so, so many people in America have one arm, so building an interface for one-armed user is not really worthwhile. It's not a good business case. But then everybody holding a baby is also a one-armed user. And all of a sudden, you've got millions of users facing the same issues, facing the same problems. We're all humans, we all need kind of like support in those things, so think inclusive about this. And that's all I have, so thanks very much. I guess we have time for questions, in case you don't mind the pizza anymore. <laughs> I guess there's a lot of to take in. Uh, I upload all that stuff. I've written a lot about it. And uh, just look at these services. It's just amazing what we can do for humans and how we can allow people to make mistakes and still give them the right content. And this is what I think most of our interfaces are not doing right right now. We have a happy path, but we don't have the error path. And we love using the error path. I cite it long and I know that. <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. The one thing is around the, the machines removing things automatically. You know that idea of you know a human might not want to see something but have to see in order to change their view on the world. What do you think about, about that? You know? The the ethics of content moderation are a big problem. Like, I mean, there is content that has been identified as illegal, that has been flagged up with a checksum that we compare against. So that is totally fine by me ethically to say, like, nobody should ever see that again. If now somebody in the, uh, in the Emirates should not see a lady in, the, in a bikini because it's not normal for them, again, you have to abide to the law. By the law. There was just this video of this lady in the, in the minister the last few days. My, I'm not offended by that. I don't think it's the right thing. It's her choice to, to, do, to dress whatever she wants to be at. But you have to tweak it sometimes to fulfill a law. And that's the problem with that. I think uh, um, unless it's fully legal content, it's always, it flags you up as like to be moderated. So you are still asked to do this. Computers not giving you the information that you need because they think it's not right. This is what we have with fake news right now. This is what we have with those things. So that's another discussion. I'd love to have it. I'd love to talk to people about it because we're becoming very content of just hearing the things we want to hear. And machines are very good at giving us this like happy middle ground of information. And I don't think that's going to bring us further as humans. We need to go into the edge cases as well. But that doesn't mean that I would ever have to see child pornography because the laws, again, in this problem is if your website posts it, you go to jail. Even if you didn't know, even if you never
never seen it. And if you saw it and reported it, you also go to jail because you're also a consumer. So that's the real issue with that. That like as soon as something is visible and seen by you, you become part of it. It's harder to actually get around. It's my favorite example of people like I've got nothing to hide, so why shouldn't the government look at everything I do? The question is like, what do you do when somebody made up a stupid story about a part of the information about you and you have to defend yourself over and over again about this? You don't have nothing to hide, that's fine. But you also have to defend yourself against the wrong stories or the wrong uh, moderation that happened around your things. A friend of mine just got blocked from Facebook because he has, she has a few pictures where she said her cleavage is a bit bigger than Facebook thinks is not uh, is okay. She basically is not available on Facebook anymore, and it doesn't make any sense. Whereas, like other people have to be spouting Nazi propaganda, are totally still on Facebook. So we we have to find ways to do that. But what what I said was the the checksum of the information that is known. I love that there is a database of things humans should not see anymore that can be removed from the web before people have to see it again. So I have no ethical problem with that. But you're totally right that content moderation always has to go with it. No, in the uh, in, in the Interpol uh, uh, in the Interpol database, it's basically things that are in human to look at, not like nudity or something like that. These are all beheading videos. These are all the things we use at Google.org or these kind of things. Basically, shock value things that somebody had to suffer for for that picture to be taken that should not be consumed by humans anymore. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> If you want to see, uh, no, I don't have it. I mean, uh, if I have my Windows machine with me, um, <laughs> there's a plugin for PowerPoint that we showed at uh, at Build, which blew me away, which was pretty amazing. It's while I'm presenting, it's recording my uh, voice and does subtitles under my slides, so you could have seen subtitles of what I'm saying right now. You on your Android or your iOS device or Say Windows Mobile because nobody has one. <laughs> could, have, ooh, could have connected to it and asked in your language to get the subtitles. So while I'm presenting in the PowerPoint, it translates it for all the different people on their phones in their language so they can they can follow along in case they don't speak English and they can't read English. That's pretty much nuts that this is a plugin in JavaScript for PowerPoint. PowerPoint is useful for change, it's quite amazing. <laughs> Cool, we're good. Thanks.